Hi, this is Professor Lusheen, and this is Lecture 27, Hazard Communication. Uh, I borrowed this PowerPoint deck from um, one of the OSHA training institutes. Uh, what I'd like to do real quick, though, um, I didn't do any edits to it. I want to show you it in its natural state, is, you know, what is hazard communication? Um, why is it a concern? Well, if you ever were interested in looking at the most frequently cited standards, you go into the help resources from the OSHA homepage. There is annual inspection data, there's data and statistics. I'll click on that. There are two different search engines you can use on the OSHA website. The first one is frequently cited OSHA standards, and this is per industry. So if you have the NAICS for the industry, you want to look it up, you can do that. You can also um, search by uh, the actual standard itself and find out which industries have been cited by it. But for the, for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to click on the most commonly used stats. And here it's got the 2018, which I believe is the most recent. Has comes number two. So um, as far as general industry is concerned, it's number one for general industry. So, you know, why are so many companies being cited by Hascom? Well, it's because it tends to be more of a program and it's easier to spot violations because it has to do with labeling. All you really have to do is find a chemical container that doesn't have a label and it can be cited. And if you look at the actual programs themselves, employers aren't doing assessments or inventories pre uh, uh, program writing um, and that's also causing them to get citations so it's the number one cited and also almost every workplace has some form of uh, has this chemical because everybody's cleaning chemicals and they they are covered um, here is the OSHA's uh, HASCOM page I could just give you a tour of this and this would give you everything you needed so safety data sheets used to be called material safety data sheets um, it's got you know, things you can just look at here, so a quick card. It's going to talk about pictograms. It's going to talk about the sections. Uh, the reason for all this information is, was it 2015? Uh, OSHA's HASCOM adopted Global Harmonized um, Systems, or GHS. And um, what it did is it made it so it's standard. It used to be very haphazard as far as an employer who produced a product that had a hazardous chemical in it had to create a material safety data sheet. And it was all across the board as far as the quality and what they had. What they're attempting to do is not only standardize, but make it more international because internationally they use the GHS system, which is pictograms. So instead of having to be able to decipher language, pictures are meant to indicate what the, the hazards are or what to be concerned about with that product. It, it just, it's supposed to make it more universal. Uh, let's see, global harmonized system. Yeah, I got that right. Uh, here are the pictograms themselves. Uh, I used to test students on all this stuff, but I'm not gonna test you. Just health hazards, got the Starman. Um, if anybody played uh, Nintendo's wrestling, Starman. Uh, flame, right, like this is, is for fire hazard, exclamation point is for an irritant or skin sensitizer. If you have compressed gases, gas cylinder. If it's a corrosive, you see it's burning hands and metal. For an exploding bomb, and it looks like a, something that's exploding. A flame over circle is an oxidizer, that's what the O stands for. If the uh, trees and fish are dead, it's a, a environmental toxin. Skull and bones means acute, so it could kill you. Um, so, the is it the Jolly Roger? Isn't that the symbol? The pirate, acute toxicity. So uh, these are these are what you'll find on the safety data sheets now, and it, it is just meant to be more again more universal, uh, easier to follow. And um, the other reason I'll bring this up and I'll show you later is that uh, my students who do internships, this tends to be a pretty common assignment because it's a, it's it's a tedious task to do a full hazard material or I should say hazardous chemical inventory but if you do it right you don't have to do it that often and um, it just makes things easier uh, let's see I also wanted to show you where's that information uh, guidance so I could have I could have tacked on all these under the uh, lecture I didn't want to and I think that the lecture slide deck that we're using will refer to many of these OSHA publications 3844, 3695, 3696. 
So these are meant to be things to help an employer develop an effective HASCOM, but obviously people aren't using them. Maybe I will throw this one in, but what it really comes down to is you do the hazardous chemical inventory first. And once you do that, everything else becomes very easy. Not easy, but easier to do. So let's go back to the presentation and then I will come back to here and kind of show you what I've provided you, but I will be adding um, that fact sheet just because I, it looks pretty good. Go back to here. Really, it's always gonna make me, all right. So again, I borrowed this slide deck. Uh, so, you know, why this? You know, if you look at what causes injuries and fatalities, uh, exposure to chemicals is not very high on the list. Uh, contact dermatitis is probably the most common, but it's usually inexpensive. But these, so these usually aren't, it's not super high, super, it's not super high. It's not top of the priority list. Sorry about that. Here are the major elements here. So standardizing of the safety data sheets, uh, the use of pictograms, uh, they standardize the use of uh, labels, warnings, and, and, and danger and stuff like that. Uh, so labels are a big deal, and that's where companies tend to get cited. Uh, it's got some other information there as well. The employer is responsible for obtaining any safety data sheets. They're also responsible. Uh, this standard has come, which is 29 CFR 1910-1200-1200. In many states is called right to know. It's the uh, employee's right to know what they're working with so that uh, they, they know what the hazard is, how it could possibly enter their body, uh, and then what protections are being put in place to prevent that from happening. But if they do get exposed, what are some of the symptoms and what do they do? So if someone isn't feeling well, oh, what have you been, what have you been working with? Um, Kind of like uh, when I in the last lecture when I talked about you know an, an industrial hygienist being like a detective. It's like oh, there are symptoms. What did they get exposed to? Um, and I explained to you how I use things like the NIOSH pocket guide, the safety data sheets, all these things to try to decipher what the what uh, the people are being exposed to. You know, I did have a case once that uh, this employee complained that they're being overexposed to airborne uh, oil mist. Uh, it was I used it as a cutting fluid uh, to cool things down and to keep the uh, particulate down. And but when I looked at the safety data sheet, the symptoms that the complainant was were had indicated um, more aligned with ingestion and not inhalation. And you know everybody was planning for me to go show up and do air monitoring, but from my experience, seeing the condition of the air. It, it, you know, if I wasn't told to be there because of an oil misinhalation, I probably wouldn't have sampled. It just didn't look that bad. It looked like it was, yeah, there was a little bit in the end, there's a little bit on surfaces, but not to the level that I'd seen prior. And I had done oil mist uh, air exposures and they were even low when I saw higher levels. But when I saw in the safety data sheet it was ingestion, I started looking around. And I found that workers were consuming food and uncovered beverages at their workstation and they were getting their hands covered in this stuff. So it wasn't, you know, a, an air control or a respiratory protection issue. It was a hygiene issue that workers cannot have open con open beverage containers. And I'm talking like cans of Mountain Dew. They can't be hoofing down Snicker bars or eating Doritos when their hands are full of cutting fluid. They're consuming enough oil that this guy was uh, getting sick. Um, and so we corrupted that and then the guy got better he recovered here's how hascom works you know you you get the information i mean you should be storing all chemicals that you purchase you know cleaning chemicals work chemicals they all should have a place they should all have a designated place i don't know if you guys do that when you go grocery shopping but everything that i get from the grocery store has a designated place a place it goes that i know where it is and then also when i'm going to go shopping i can look to see what you know how much of things do i have and there's therefore i can put things on the list or know that i have enough each chemical should have a place it should have a designated place so you know how much you have and where it goes and then it should be stored properly you know you shouldn't put incompatible chemicals next to each other because what if they mix you know they can they can either have a violent reaction or they can give off a uh, a vapor that is dangerous or noxious so everything should have its place. The safety data sheet should accompany 
or the binder of safety data sheets or ac the, the ability to uh, access online versions should be somehow linked to how you're storing things. So there is a little bit of housekeeping and OCD when it comes to this stuff. So the employers have to get that stuff, they have to keep an inventory, they have to determine how workers, how things are being stored, labeled, uh, how workers are handling, so how they're taking it out of storage, putting it into the work environment, you know, if there's a spill, what do you do? Um, when it's in process, is it being you know introduced to the environment or is it being contained? And then we could we could really start talking about RICRA and whether the products that have a hazardous chemical into it transition into a hazardous waste. You know that would be the cradle to grave. So, you know, Hascom does butt up against against um, an environmental rule, RICRA. It talks about the labeling and training. Workers just need to know what they're handling, what's there, so they don't accidentally expose themselves or coworkers, and if there is a leak and an incidental release uh, they know what to do they know how to respond they know where to find the information uh, but hopefully they're not being exposed and also that goes into the selection of proper PPE oh they're gonna be working with a, uh, a substance that has a very high pH which to say it's very caustic well uh, and some people say basic I say caustic uh, Therefore, what sort of gloves, what sort of apron, what sort of face shield do they need? Knowing that there's a potential for splash, it's a low potential, but still it's a potential, or there's a high potential, therefore we need more of a covering, or maybe we need to put in like a shield. Do you see how this stuff, you know, this has come as very much a detection or an assessment, uh, and then some information, and then it leads to things like PPE engineering controls, um, RICRA, things like that. I see it all, as all being interconnected because if you're doing it properly, you're um, you're getting more done with the time you put into it versus doing each having them be siloed and um, not sharing information uh, within each. So there isn't a consistent message. Workers like consistent messages. So list of hazardous chemicals present. I call that the inventory, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. Uh, availability of SDSs. Now, should workers be trained to read an SDS? or should they be trained on what they're working with and how to possibly get that information should they need it? I tend to lean towards the latter because you go, okay, this is how you read a safety data sheet, they're over here, and I'll go back to work. It's like, okay, you explain to them these are the things you're working with and this, and then give them examples that you're working with this, this is the hazard, and this is where you find on the safety data sheet. So give them what they need, but there's some guidance as well. Don't make it so overwhelming. How to read labels, how to respect them, uh, all this stuff. So this is getting into you know, the information you can find, not only on a label but on SDS. Sixteen sections. You, people will have the binders or the SDS binders. Many companies are moving to an online uh, uh, library of them, but then you get to train workers on how to access that. And if the system goes down, um, what's the backup? And so, I don't know if you could fully, completely remove the uh, the physical binder of um, SDSs. You see here under section two, this is where you've got uh, signal word, pictogram, and classifications. These all relate to things we had talked about earlier in the semester as well. So labeling, um, <laughs> there are companies who actually could provide you so you can print your own labels, or there are label stations. Uh, but workers need to know, you know, a danger in red, that's the highest level. Um, warning, caution, the, you know, are, are further down the line. Um, and if, if labels are damaged, you have to replace them. Or maybe you need to use a label that doesn't get damaged. Here's a sample right here of a label. It doesn't have to be perfect like this. This is a sample. But it does say that you need to have this stuff readily available. A lot of shipping containers or DOT labels will have a lot of this information as well. But not on older stuff. Here's more information here. You got to train workers at least how to read. You can also have to have it in a language that they understand. So if you have a population of workers who speak Portugal, well, your HASCOM should be in Portugal as well as in English. Here's the training requirements. So training is required before initial assignment, when new hazards introduced, and non-routine tasks, but I, annually. People, you, you, companies usually evolve to annual HASCOM training, and they should be also improving it every year and learning from any issues that happened over the year. You always got to discuss real things that had happened. Uh, they've got the biohazard uh, symbol here in the middle. Uh, it talks about shipping labels, NFPA labels, 
all this stuff. You know, it's just requirements. So if you have to generate your own, make sure they meet these standards. Uh, here's a shipping label. It contains pretty much the same things I just talked about that. Here's another Hascom example. So it's got the flammability symbol. It'd be nice to know, you know how NFPA would rank this. We used to have the NFPA diamond that was used. Um, it's, a lot of SDSs will have multiple forms. They'll have the uh, NFPA diamond indicating flammability, reactivity, uh, health hazard, and special information. So there are four uh, parts to the diamond. And then there's also HMIS, Hazardous Material Information System, which is uses a similar color coding, but not in the diamond format. I'm just pointing things out. Thank you. Here are the pictograms we looked at before. Um, yeah, workers should be able to identify what these things are and how they're, um, how it, it affects how they do work, how they handle things, making sure that uh, labels are not damaged. They can still read them and understand what's there. Uh, let's see what else. Ah, oh, I, I, I talk about it, then it shows up. So on the left, we got the HMIS. On the right, we've got the NFPA diamond. Blue is health, red is flammability, uh, yellow is reactivity, and then white is special information. Interesting. So NFPA 704 is the diamond, and they talk about it here. Uh, what's interesting? I should talk about this now. So under NFPA diamond, under HMIS, a zero to one is very low, a three to four is higher. Under GHS, it flip-flops. So a one under GHS is dangerous, a four is not. So that's gonna be confusing to some people, and I think that's why they possibly kept both systems on the SDSs for now, until people understand it. Yep, there's a coding for HMIS. I've walked around places and seen uh, billboards where people can fill in the information and put it on. Yeah, cool. DOT containers. What's interesting is I've learned to read the DOT placards that you see on the back of tankers, and if I see something that's really hazardous, I do what I can to try to get by that that uh, vehicle. I don't want to be behind a truck that has explosives or toxic or um, something that reacts with water. I'd rather be by them. More DOT stuff, locating information, and we are done with the presentation. All right, let's, let me go back and show you some of the things I've got. So uh, we looked at the HASCOM page. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, you can purchase a subscription. Here's just an example here with Vivid Learning Systems, which are a subsidiary of HSI, Health and Safety Institute, where um, they will take care of it for you. Um, if you've got so many, you can take care of it there. Uh, if you need a safety data sheet, uh, you can go to places like uh, Millipore Sigma and type in the information and you can find them. Or you can Google. You can usually find safety data sheets now online. Uh, for a while there, you always had to go to the manufacturer, but they tend to put them online in PDF now. So they're fairly easy to acquire should you need them. Uh, here are some examples. Oh, I'm going to show you. So here's the um, inventory I was talking about. This should be first. This is the first thing you do. You've got a product name, you've got a manufacturer, uh, the amount stored, the size of the container, uh, what form it's in, its cast number, chemical number, percent by volume, quantity if you can calculate it, is there a safety data sheet on site, the hazard identification information, type of exposure, exposure control, symptoms of exposed, is, there, is that it? Yeah, symptoms of exposed. So in this chemical, in this particular product, then they've got these constituents. And you can get all this information from the safety data sheet. So you do all this. And then you could actually, then you could sort this by a particular constituent to know how much of a certain chemical you have on site. And that would be for the EPCRA or possibly the process safety management. Because you need to know quantities for that. And this becomes the basis, the starting point for developing your HASCOM program. And this should be easily, I mean, you could put different tabs for different areas, different tabs for different types of products. There's a lot of ways you can go with this once you've built this. And so my students have done projects where they build this for employers and that's the first step. Now, once you have this, the rest of it kind of comes into play. 
And so I've got here some students at a HASCOM program. So they're referencing the um, OSHA website and they should be also, so here they're actually saying they want the people who are high up in the company to sign off on it. That's a great plan, great recommendation. Who is responsible for what? Another good plan. We got the inventory, information about labels, wish they had examples, talks about safety data sheets. So this is a great skeleton, or I should say boilerplate, for a HASCOM program, at least because they didn't have one. Here's a HASCOM for um, a project somebody did. It's a case study. They provided the scope, other information, um, why you need it, methods, results. See there, they've got the label information, and they've got the cost involved. Look at that real quick. What are they recommending? The purchase of labor. Oh, they want to make their own labels. Okay, weekly audits and the savings. So they're saying they're showing a savings of seventy-three thousand based on what the OSHA violation could be or the possible accidents. Cool. Convince management. It's good to invest. I like that. Here's a case study. Sec GHS and secondary container labeling. And they give their recommendations. They identify the problem and the solution and provide results. So this is very much a summary. But I think you're seeing some of the common things is you know purchasing the labeling, per being able to print them. Uh, I, I know I've had students and oh, look at that. They've got a, a, a SDS board or whatever, HASCOM board. Isn't that cool? You can go and create your own. It's customizable. I like that a lot. Um, I know I've had students in the past also do the inventory and then make recommendations for investing in a safety data sheet uh, management system. They, they can be expensive. Those things can run tens of thousands per year. You got to kind of weigh, you know, do we have the time to handle this as ourselves uh, versus what it would cost if we were to get cited because it is most frequently cited standard. So it's good to bring that up. So I believe that is everything I had wanted to share with you. Although I'm going to, again, I'm going to attach the 3696 here. But um, at least you can get some examples, see some examples of how this can be done. A, an inventory, like a hazardous chemical inventory based on product name uh, in Excel is the key to having a good HASCOM program because then it builds from that and then audit it you know once a year or every you know twice a year whatever you need to make sure everything's up to date make sure that the training is continually being improved and you won't uh, be part of the statistics of the most cited uh, has come standard